hear from academia from around the world, uh, different things that are um, different kinds of projects, different kinds of uh, activities that are taking place to help level us all up and um, provide some more visibility into what's happening. But a really important part of this session, I'm hoping, is Q&A, and that uh, we all have a chance to uh, have an interactive uh, discussion here today as well. So uh, we're missing a couple of people, Les Terrace, we need to hunt down, and uh, Ted Chow. I hope that they are here, and Thomas. I just saw this one. Uh, well, come on up with me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, if um, maybe William, you, you can see if they're out in the hallway, and we'll get started. Um, so you know, the way we're going to structure it today is uh, I've asked each of our distinguished panelists to take five minutes. Um, provide some slides, present uh, you know, some of uh, our current activities, and um, some of them also have mentioned some of the challenges, and then you know, hoping to use that as a launching point for us to uh, open up a discussion and, um, and an interactive session here today. So do we have the slides up, the clicker? I don't see the clicker. David, do you have perhaps? Or is it this? So, um, you know, these, these are um, we have two of the four here, and hopefully the other two will be joining us uh, shortly. And then Thomas is joining me. Thomas and I are both from the ONF. And so uh, I would say with that, um, it happens that you are both the first to present as well, so the timing is good uh, in, in that way. So why don't we um, get started? Stefan? Other, uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, so, you know, I'm an associate professor at the uh, University of Pierre Marie Curie uh, in Paris, also called Paris East. So, uh, uh, yesterday we had a kind of brainstorming uh, to try to figure out what to talk about, and uh, uh, Thomas asked us to, to make some exercise um, to think about. Uh, future trends, but also about how we uh, are integrating SDN in our uh, teaching activity. Uh, so I will mostly uh, give uh, um, uh, some ideas about uh, uh, future trends in this uh, uh, area of SDN. In fact, uh, Thomas said, now that we are, so let's welcome also Efterius, our colleague. So uh, Thomas said yesterday, um, now that SDN is more or less ready, we are integrating it in our operational network. So, uh, what can we do next? So, uh, in uh, this as a, as SN, as N, as DN5 environments, uh, we can do pretty much everything. So, uh, what's next in terms of research perspective? So, um, are, are we able to go through uh, all the steps that we can? Uh, go through uh, targeting uh, through automation in networks. And uh, uh, think about that. Uh, I try uh, to list here a few examples of operations that we could already do without SDN. Uh, so in legacy networks, so uh, that operations that look like uh, intelligent operations, so let's say. Uh, so uh, I've listed here something that we do teach in UPMC uh, uh, in uh, uh, master level. Uh, Courses about uh, uh, provider networks. So, uh, we do uh, know pretty well how to do, for example, end to bandwidth uh, uh, in link management uh, in NPLS networks. So, this end to bandwidth operation requires some smart algorithm that is able to monitor the level of bandwidth that is going through a tunnel and, based on that, to adapt the reservation level on, on the links. So, this is a, a smart operation and uh, is uh, uh, not so intuitive to determine the, uh, the observation period during which you are establishing the uh, bandwidth level that you are going to keep for the next uh, period over the link. So this is something that it was already possible before this year. What else? Uh, when uh, I started my PhD a long time ago, uh, about 10 years ago, we were working on a, a routing optimization. At that time, we found out that there were already algorithms that were running in uh, Network control planes at that time, those were uh, not strictly speaking as the end control planes. And there, what you did was uh, uh, what people, researchers were working on 
was uh, finding out algorithms to uh, automatically compute, uh, you know, OSPF weights to indirectly uh, affect the route that packets are going to take. And then uh, there has been a, a quite a lot of amount of work on this uh, type of uh, research activity. And that is also a kind of intelligent algorithm that is going to compute on a regular basis new routing ways to help traffic routes in another way while relying on a distributed network, so not an SDN network. In the computing side, we had, uh, since about since 2009, 2010, uh, virtualization platforms that uh, started to uh, implementing adaptive orchestration of virtual machines across clusters uh, based on the observation of computing states, such as how much CPU is used over there, how much over there, how much traffic is headed to that virtual machine rather than to that other virtual machine. There we find, in these uh, kind of scenarios, we find uh, online scheduling algorithms that are also pretty smart. So what can we do more in SDN environment? So what SDN is able, uh, uh, is able to open to, uh, to, uh, to our activities as researchers when we, when we find uh, that there are problems to be solved in uh, unconventional ways. So, um, I've seen that there are a few posters that are uh, addressing, that are presenting works that are addressing some of the previous examples I gave of problems that were already solved in code SDN at some extent. So what can we do uh, beyond that? So what are we able to do now that we have SDN that, are, that is making our network strongly uh, programmable? So what we can do is to uh, try to conceive new network adaptation algorithms that are able to uh, take profit of all this new information that we are able to collect. So we have uh, uh, now uh, multiple uh, interfaces, sub-band interfaces that are able to collect information that we did not collect before. So can we take new type of decisions in adapting the network? Uh, can we adapt the network in a finer way than what we could do with legacy protocols? So this is something see happening in uh, the network research field, so uh, people are trying now to integrate uh, analytics in uh, network optimization. So the people are called this, uh, this new field of research prescriptive uh, analytics. So how can we take decisions that are not simply based on measurement, but also based on predictions about those metrics that we are measuring in real time. So this is something that uh, is very promising. Uh, we see that the analytics uh, blocks are being integrated in various open source projects, almost included, but also we see in ONAP, uh, we see the uh, 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 architecture trying to uh, add in the space for this innovation for integrating such algorithms in uh, SDN networks. So, what else can we do? Uh, we have also the northbound uh, interfaces that are able to give to the applications much more information about. So uh, historically, networks are created in such a way that uh, users are not made fully aware of the network they are connected to. When, uh, for example, a wireless user using a cellular phone tries to call, it is not how much bandwidth is, is available, how much spectrum is available, how much the others are getting while trying to access the same service. This information is typically hidden by service providers. Now that we have not about interfaces, conceptually, we can give more information to the users so they can, they can decide the terms that they use can get uh, the resources in, an, uh, in another way than the legacy way. So the legacy way is a situation where the provider exploits the fact that the user don't know what's happening in the network to allocate resources in a proportional way, typically. So it's proportional uh, fairness still, does it still make sense in an SDN environment? So we are, we have some ongoing activity on that, uh, that essentially uh, uh, are targeted to a, a redefinition of fairness in SDN environments, because users now can be made, uh, uh, as I said, uh, aware of, uh, better aware of the state of the network. And then we have the computing layer again, as I said before, we have this additional dimension that typically was not part of the uh, recipe when defining new uh, uh, orchestration now that we have the computing layer there, that we know we can uh, scale in and scale out computer resources that are assigned to network functions and to 
regions, how can we change the way networks are typically operated and is orchestration decision, how should we uh, define that? And uh, so, uh, when talking about network artificial intelligence, so you think about new algorithms that are taking profit of all this information. So what do we do like when we define decision algorithms? We like uh, algorithms that are able to uh, change the decision from time to time. Okay, so only stupid person don't change their mind. So if the network change, the network states change, then the decision can be changed. This is something that happened, for example, in the 90s. Uh, probably you were already, uh, were not already working on uh, that work, but at that time there was a kind of revolution. So people were introducing traffic engineering algorithms in networks that were not able to change quite often and at that time it was considered as a revolution because the network was were starting at that time to be uh, uh, managed in a, a dynamic way. So uh, we have, we would like to have uh, decisions that are able to change from time to time, how often we don't know, but uh, we know that we, we are not now able to make the networks either more dynamic also thanks to the uh, computing layer that which is added what we don't like when defining decision algorithms is getting into decision loops so that we decide to root packet over our way and then we change the decision out over another way and then we come back to the same decision. So we would like to avoid when defining uh, network adaptation algorithm to get into this kind of decision loop to take bad new decisions to just here again. Uh, if we look at the autobahn with uh, algorithm, they've seen there is a poster which is addressing this type of problem. So how can adapt the link reservation level? We should do it in a, a robust way, as the, uh, those people from Milan are presenting in their posters. And um, uh, we don't like to change decision too often. It's okay to change decision, but not to, it's not good to change it every few milliseconds, for example. That to happen. So these are open questions about uh, the management of networks in an SDN environment where, where we can uh, integrate very smart and very capable, hopefully uh, capable at, at the right level of extent to uh, adapt the network state. So these are just a few ideas that I throw on the table and just to let you think and if you have questions about, uh, or suggestions how this type of research could be conducted. So we are, we are able to talk about that. Good. Thank you. All right, James. My clicker is on the podium. My name is uh, James Hong. I'm a professor from Huang University of Science and Technology. I was told that I have five minutes uh, for my presentation for this panel. So I thought as a professor uh, teaching research, uh, the two important aspects of being a professor. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, briefly uh, research and development activities. Um, and recently, network virtualization, I believe, is a very important topic for SDN and NFB uh, currently, as well as for, say, 5G network era. They talk about network slicing, but there's no clear definition of network slicing in 5G um, community yet. So what we're working on folks working on network virtualization for SDN and NFB, uh, we can adopt and perhaps use that in the 5G networks. And, and for uh, IoT, uh, we get millions of billions of devices that are being deployed and attached to the network, uh, doing various interesting things. Uh, they would uh, prefer or it would be nice to have their own slices in some cases. P4 uh, in-band network telemetry, 
which are being presented uh, in this uh, event as well. Uh, we are also working on that. Uh, autonomic network management, uh, um, Sachi uh, uh, gave a, a nice brief presentation on this. Uh, Self-driving network, AI for network management, uh, knowledge-based network management, uh, knowledge-defined networking are similar terminologies for applying machine learning and AI techniques for networking and network management. Um, I believe it's also an important area. Now, so those are some of the areas that I'm interested in and my uh, PhD students are working on uh, these days. Now, part of education, education <laughs> for students, developers, as well as operators, I believe is very important for SDN and NFV. So for this, I've been working on creating uh, MOOC courses, that is massive open online courses. And uh, I talked uh, about this with the Gru and Timon at ONS in the spring. And over the summer, I created, uh, made MOOC courses with uh, my uh, student uh, Jiang and uh, Seon uh, based on the software defined networking course that I gave uh, for the past several years. And it is now available uh, since three weeks ago to first to the Korean community uh, developers. Um, so when you visit this uh, website, Postec X, that's similar to edX, Coursera, Udacity, that's our uh, Postec version of it. And more specifically, the Graduate School of uh, Information Technology that I'm in charge, we're providing senior level, <laughs> undergraduate, as well as graduate level courses, particularly SDN, NFV, IoT, Big Data, and so on. Okay, so we started offering, providing five uh, courses since three weeks ago, and SDN, NFV, um, and and uh, all courses are given in Korean for the Korean audience, uh, although most of the lecture notes are uh, provided uh, or prepared in English. I'm actually offering Internet of Things course concurrently with post-tech. I have post-tech students taking the course inside and then providing it outside. So we have uh, about half of our students are international students or non-Korean speaking students, so I have to prepare and deliver my lectures in, in English. So we're providing that with the Korean subtitle. Anyway, if you're interested, you can visit and uh, uh, actually uh, listen to my lectures on SDN NFV as well as Internet of Things uh, for free. Okay. And I plan to do more for those people in, in industry. And this was motivated by Recent, uh, few, uh, in the spring, I got a phone call from uh, a middle box solution vendor who's been doing very well in Korea as well as exporting uh, to around the world. And uh, he got a phone call from uh, their customer saying, we don't want to buy hardware boxes anymore. We just want to buy your VNS. And this is a senior executive a uh, former graduate of our university uh, gave me a call, asked me, Professor Hong, what is BNF? How do you create one? How do you develop one? Was uh, their uh, question. And so we, had, we prepared a training program. We helped them, uh, their developers, um, installing, say, Onos. We gave a, a code walkthrough tutorial, as well as uh, OpenStack, and so on. And uh, when you uh, visit this uh, course, we also provide tutorials as well as so theoretical aspects as well as uh, more practical aspects for people to install uh, Onos and Cord, etc. Um, graduate internships. Uh, since three years ago, the, the partnership that we had with the ON Lab, um, the my training uh, of the, our graduate students have been do research at school in the lab, 
um, as, as uh, before. And whatever they're working on their PhD topic, then when they finish or when they almost uh, done the theoretical work, uh, I sent them to ON Lab. And thanks to Guru, uh, uh, Bill, uh, and, the, and uh, Thomas, uh, generous people who've been helping my graduate students to implement the stuff. Jiang Li, working on control plane management. Uh, Yunsen Han, who worked on network virtualization. And currently, Chung Wan Hyun, working on uh, P4 and INT. And I have another student, uh, Woo Jung Kim, working on MCOR. So that's been my way of uh, advising my PhD students to do theoretical work in the lab, but do the actual validation of their work in open source implementation at uh, ON Lab. So that's my five minutes. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Left turn. Sorry. I don't need any slides. Hi, everyone. My name is Lefteris Manasakis. Uh, I'm working in the Foundation of Research and Technology in Greece. And uh, my team is called the Inspire Group from the initials Internet Security, Privacy, and Intelligence Research. We are a young group. Uh, comparatively, because we started in 2014. After uh, my professor, my principal investigator, Xenophontas Dimitropoulos, uh, got the funding from the European Research Council, a very prestigious funding uh, st uh, starting uh, grant, it's called by the European Research Council, of 1.5 million from a, for a project called Netvolution. Uh, the project who started, the idea of it started in 2012 by a paper written by my colleague and present in the conference, Vasilios Kotronis, back then a PhD student in ETH Czech, about outsourcing the routing control logic of BGP and the interdomain routing. This was the initial idea in 2012. The paper was written again, I say, by Vasilis and uh, Xenophontas Dimitropoulos. And uh, this idea uh, became a, a project proposal to the European Research Council, and we got the funding uh, for, the, uh, for five years of 1.5 million in order to do research on interdomain routing and how software defined networking can help outsource the routing control logic. Uh, so that the internet a better environment uh, was uh, the conference that uh, mostly is looking for radical ideas, for ideas that create discussion between the academia. And that's what we did, and uh, we started this way. So, uh, since 2014, we are working on uh, different topics uh, of uh, research. M our main uh, research uh, focus are, uh, as I said, interdomain routing, uh, network monitoring, uh, or again in the interdomain, not in the local level, uh, software defined networking, and this is the reason why we are here. And, uh, um, Network measurements. Uh, network measurements is a uh, internet network measurements is a big part of our research, and uh, this year we again we uh, have one more paper in the, the internet measurements conference uh, that is purely measurements. Um, and uh, what I want to say as an introduction about us is that we did. This project, the Netvolution project that I'm talking about, uh, has different packages. One of the packages that it, it has working packages is called, uh, in order for everyone to understand, in every uh, European project, you have sp specific working packages that uh, the project is divided into, and uh, you need to tackle each one of them in order to be 
successful uh, conducting and fulfilling the goals of the project. One of the working packages it was for us to find uh, a network uh, operating system that will actually orchestrate, that will uh, do uh, the, uh, what the Netvolution project was about, to outsource the routing control logic of routers and make, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very <coughs> complex idea to explain in three or four minutes, but perhaps we can discuss it later how exactly we were envisioning it. And for, for the network operating system, we didn't have done much of anything as research, as a group. We've done on, on every other aspect of the project, but not on the network operating system. And when we first met, uh, I mean, uh, 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 read about it and start working on Monos, we realized that this is the perfect uh, solution, this is the perfect um, software that will uh, support our project and our ideas when it comes to uh, a network operating system because uh, Monos, as everybody knows, is uh, service provider oriented and uh, very, a very important aspect is that it speaks BGP for us. So it supports legacy protocols. Because as I was saying yesterday in the Honos Basics, uh, the, part of the fact that uh, uh, software defined network, uh, networking controllers like Honos support legacy protocols is very important for the uh, adoption of, uh, of uh, software uh, of SDN uh, controllers. Because cannot uh, change overnight the infrastructure and the, the logic and the, everything from a, from a network that is operating now and it needs to stay operating. Um, so the story, because the story is uh, has a little, you know, it's a little interesting. In 2016, in the summer of 2016, uh, we presented the demo in SICOM in Brazil about uh, an idea, a research idea, which called Artemis. Artemis comes again from the initials um, uh, automated real-time uh, uh, real-time uh, automated in real-time it's very it's difficult automated in real-time uh, mitigation uh, and security mitigation system which is about uh, uh, preventing and uh, uh, securing from BGP prefix hijacking. Um, so in 2016, we, we, we presented in SICOM, and one of ONF uh, people that are working for ONF, back then he was not, he was an intern, Carmelo Cascone, was there also, and then met with one of my colleagues, uh, Pablo Cervezes, and uh, he said, Pablos, this is a very good idea, I like it. Why don't you uh, try it with Onos and see what Onos is about? So from Carmelo, uh, Pablos, my colleague, came back to Greece, took a SDN course, uh, which is a master's course at the University of Crete. And uh, we have our first intern, Dimitris Navarmatis, who's working with Thomas in the ONF in Menlo Park. So one thing led to another. That's what I was trying to say. And uh, it's a feel good story for me. And uh, uh, what I felt since last year's Honors Build, and uh, that's what I want to express, is that apart from you know going to pure uh, science conferences that we do all the time, so where uh, you have to, you know, the, the goal to, goals and the um, Aspects of, of a uh, pure science conference differ a lot from this one because this one is about people who love what they do and uh, they they try to um, you know to express it in uh, in multiple ways. What I'm trying to say is that uh, in last year in Paris, I felt that people were friendly and 
that's what I brought back to Greece. People were friendly, were um, expressive, <coughs> were... Um, it, it's like a community that uh, we all love the same thing. That's how I can describe it the best way. And this is the reason why I was attracted to the community and to, uh, to uh, honors uh, back then. And uh, that's why I also became an honors ambassador. I met mean, them at the teaching brigade. Um, and this is the end of my rant. I will stop here and I will pass the microphone to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. My name is Jin Zhao Zheng, a professor in the Department of Computer Science at NGTU. Uh, he is very joyful to be a professor, especially in NGTU, who has so many students. Uh, they all are contributors of the honors. And NGTU is a multi-campus university. Guangfu University, Guangfu campus is our main campus and uh, <coughs> one computer. In Guangfu campus, our computer center has core network and uh, edge router. Edge router connect to other departments. And we try to map this architecture to the core fabric. So I'm talking about the deployment of almost core in our campus. Uh, just a refresh for the R core architecture. R core is connecting the essential network. So we had OLT. And uh, for you, CPU, or other GPOM equipment. But in campus, we only have campus access network. It could be a legacy L2, L3 network, or it could be a, an SDN network. So we first, we repress, we repress the GPOM equipment with a wire box, open floor switch. And uh, we bring down our core network CC1, sorry, CC1 to a leaf switch. And the redundancy can be done by ECMP. So it's a perfect match of the core fabric spine and leaf. And uh, this is the, a closer look of the architecture. We have a core fabric. This is a core spine and diff. And we also have a access network in the edge router. And each point of another core architecture. And uh, this is just a picture to show the multi campus. Could be connected together by the e -court. But it's just a prep. Uh, we just finished two core parts and uh, try to connect it later. Uh, I just said that it's joyful to be a professor because we can do any research we want to do. First one probably can combine with our previous architecture. Because we have many middle bugs in our campus. But we need to way to control. So you need to properly double your investment. Also, when you pass through a single middle box, if you do not do any classification, so this will increase the demand. But service function chain can help. 
SDN can help. Besides how we said to read uh, Luca, uh, he gave us a chance to join the SDNIP Global Development in August 2016. After that, we continue to deploy SDNIP in Taiwan. And later this year, we were connected to the NICD Japan. Besides, we also install OAI EPC in Core in the Box. And the EAB test, we use real handset and the SIM card to access internet to see the YouTube streaming video. And the, as I said, we can do any research. So I do some academic research because my origin, original interest in this in heterogeneous wise networking. So I combine the handover techniques with the SDN future. In the campus, to have multiple subnet, either wide or wireless. If user move from one subnet to another subnet, he probably need to change his IP. This is five mobile IP is immersive. So we like to apply mobility measurement in SDN domain. So we design mobility measurement as a controller app. And we want to support session continuity. So we will keep the mobile device IP unchanged, even the move. And the forwarding can be done by match and the forward instead of IP and IP tunnel. This work has been published in ICC 2017. Besides, we can apply multi-casting technique in our campus also. So we try to add some multi-casting applications as the campus service. And this multi-casting can be controlled by ourselves within the NGTU, but I think we still have a lot of work to do. And another uh, related to the debugging and uh, monitoring is the uh, inter-app consistency. Because of you implement so many apps, each one has its own right to try access rules, modify rules. This rule may be conflict one another. And uh, you probably cannot detect until the best scenario happens. Sure, there are other many, many topics we need to investigate. So I just end my talk here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that ends our you know, prepared presentation, sort of the first half of the session. So what I was hoping for now is we could start to open it up for um, dialogue, <coughs> for discussion, question and answer, and hear from all of our panelists. And, you know, I, I, you know, well, together, actually, we put together a couple of questions. We got together yesterday and talked a bit. Um, so we have some things to get us started, but also I want to open it up, you know, to the audience as well. So this doesn't have to go uh, in a strict order or sequence, you know. Uh, please, you know, I think we have two live mics in the audience. And uh, feel free to, you know, step to a mic and we'll get to your question. But when we kick it off, um, you know, I, I sort of chose to start with a relatively high-level question, which is a sort of, uh, I think, a pressing answer from uh, our perspective at the ONF you know, and at the you know, um, industry perspective, if you will. It's, you know, the industry remains slow in adopting SDN. We have troubles, you know, our, uh, we have monitors up here, but they're a little low for us sitting down, so you see us kind of looking up or back. That's what's going on. But, uh, you no, know, so the industry is having trouble adopting SDN is really the experience we're having. 
vendors are slow in stepping up to really uh, help provide you know, complete solutions. And you know, we as a community, uh, we at the ONF as an organization, as part of our mission and our charter, are trying to find ways to um, enable that, break through that, and, and move things forward. And um, you know, we would love to find ways to work more with academia and for um, academia to find ways to help with this. And so I thought this might be um, you know, a thought-provoking question that we could use to, to get started on some things. You know, is there a way, I mean, we were actually hearing some ways in which academia is already helping to, to fill the gap, you know, and not only working on problems, but educating people, uh, you know, training, um, you know, working with uh, ONF, ON Lab, People going back and forth. I mean, all of those things have, have been really helpful. But um, I mean, the big picture, from my perspective, is, is there more you know, that we can do, you know, both on your end, and on the ONF side, and, and elsewhere in the community. Does that, does that prompt any thoughts for many of you? Well, just a few words. Um, uh, I personally feel that we, we need to have the industry. Ecosystem in France because we see that among our students, nowadays about half of them are hired to work on SDM and NMV environments. Uh, major companies are scared about this revolution. And um, so, yes, academia in this case can help in educating for these persons and uh, at least give them uh, the ABCD, uh, the language needed. To integrate this, uh, uh, this evolution into the processes of uh, companies that, in some cases, as in France, are very much uh, structured, mm -hmm. so static, and uh, uh, changing the way uh, a big company works. Can so you said about half, half are hired. What happens to the other half? Uh, half are hired about to, this, um, to work on this kind of. Uh, um, R&D projects, and half of them are working mostly on operational aspects. Um, so um, I just come back. Uh, before coming here, I spent about two weeks in listening to the master defenses. And, uh, and we had students that uh, spent uh, five months uh, going around the big uh, operators and explaining to technicians what NV is. So students are also hired to educated themselves, uh, employees of big companies that uh, do not know at all what is the NV is, and NV is just to prepare them to, to what is expected as being uh, a revolution in that environment. Uh, as a, a byproduct of this, uh, this phenomenon, we were contacted by a company uh, that is afraid, more or less, as uh, a similar example than the one that James uh, presented, they are afraid about uh, NV. And they are, now they are selling bare metal, and they are afraid that their customers, major operators, will be asking them to, to give them VNFs in three to four years from now. And, uh, and uh, as a result of that, we have Kamel uh, here in the room that will start a PhD thesis in that company, and his main task will be to think about the NV architecture supporting the the use case, it is about uh, video caching and streaming and uh, supporting them in the, uh, in the transformation from a bare metal environment to a software environment. So we are seeing this, uh, this phenomenon um, uh, more and more frequently and, uh, in the last three years. And uh, it's nice, I mean, to see that uh, there are challenges uh, as teachers that we can uh, fulfill by educating the new class of engineers for these companies. Yeah, very good. Well, and the theme I heard, uh, I think, from a number of the talks was, um, you know, NFE, training in NFE, demand in NFE. Uh, there's clearly a crossover with SDN and NFE and, and with cloud as well, you know. So, um, and, and it sounds like there's uh, both demand and interest and need in that space. Well, as I mentioned in my presentation, education, educating our students in school, educating uh, developers, uh, and educating operators and 
management folks and the service providers. Um, I think that's what we need to do more. Um, well, the telcos have been uh, trying to save money because their investments uh, have been rising because of the smartphones and all, all these new smart devices generating lots and lots of traffic. And you know, to support those increased uh, traffic, they need to expand their uh, facilities, and that means more capex. Unfortunately, their revenue generation, as well as profits, unfortunately have been going down. So what do they do? In order to survive, they have to cut people. And many uh, uh, telcos, it's not easy to do. So what else can you do? Well, they try to uh, reduce the capex and opex. So they heard this wonderful terminology called SDN and NFP, which can possibly help them to reduce their expenses. Oh, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Okay, but then they uh, already invested millions and billions of dollars on their infrastructure. And it's not easy to change them because uh, the, some of the equipment, they, they last for 10, 20 years. And uh, you just cannot change their infrastructure overnight. So the new investments um, for new services, they are trying to bring in SDN and NFP technology. Now, you know, to do that, they're asking their vendors to do it. Well, vendors, uh, as I said, okay, good example. The network function box, say $10,000 per box. How much can you charge for a VNF? $100, $1,000, and it's not clear. And so vendors are trying to avoid this as well until they are forced to do it by their customers. So there's this interesting uh, financial aspects involved with telcos as well as vendors. The global vendors, we have uh, some uh, folks from Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, and so on. They don't like SDN and MV because they cannot generate the revenue as they've been doing for the last 10, 20, 30 years. So, you know, uh, Cisco, they're tr trying to delay and then uh, the, uh, uh, the advancement of this technology. Um, and then, so uh, mid-sized companies and small companies, again, in order to survive, they need business from the service providers and selling boxes they can charge more and make more money. But selling VNFs, it's not clear. So that's why the vendors are not uh, willing to uh, jump in. For example, we're in Samsung campus. When we created SDNN Forum three years ago, I talked to the, the uh, senior executive vice president responsible for that uh, area to join SDNN Forum. They said, mm, no, I don't think we need that. Until they, our customer said, we need solution. And about a year and a half ago, or almost two years ago, they joined our forum. Uh, and they've been working very hard for the last couple of years. So there are many interesting um, things that are tangled uh, for this reason for uh, the vendors not adopting quickly. And the only way that we can do as academia is educate, again, students as well as developers and operators to, to be ready and to be capable of doing things, to developing operations and management. Because clearly this is the way to go. All the telcos want this. Good, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly why we think things are stuck the way they are, is, is it's a dilemma, it's a business dilemma. And, um, you know, finding ways to 
help push the industry through it. Um, uh, it's something we think a lot about. You know, uh, education is one, but also even solving some of the technological problems you're describing. I mean, making VNFs, NFV, making them interoperable, uh, creating environments that are easy to um, work within. You know, and um, but you know, but that's some of my thoughts. I'd love to hear. Are there other thoughts on, on this topic? You know, uh, and I see we have one question. Brian, we'll get to you after. So what I think and uh, what we discuss with our group uh, is that uh, I think that many companies, many great uh, uh, big uh, service providers have adopted uh, network functions, visualization already to, uh, to a, a large percentage of their infrastructure. So this quite well. Uh, the problem is the adoption of uh, the SDN in the uh, real world in uh, real uh, demanding networks. This is uh, where I think we lack uh, as, a, as a, a community, as an industry, uh, up to now. And uh, we see sayers like the Cisco guys that were mentioned before uh, say that SDN, uh, the initials mean still does nothing. So uh, this is the challenge we have, I think, as an academic community. Implement uh, SDN principles in real uh, demanding networks. For example, the, uh, the example of China Mobile almost the last year was a very important step, in my opinion, uh, because it's an operator that has 800 million subscribers. Uh, so, showing that SDN is not just uh, an academic idea, it's, it's not just a research topic. It's, it's real, it's here, and it can solve networking problems. This is, this is my, uh, the uh, most important thing. And uh, uh, the adoption, the deployments that uh, uh, ONOS uh, is doing worldwide in mostly academic, academic networks is uh, the steps towards the right direction. And also the companies, uh, the partners of ONOS, uh, starting to uh, adopt uh, SDN solutions for, for their customers. And uh, this is, a, in my opinion, uh, uh, in uh, the SDN uh, um, story, let's say, because if it does uh, uh, be adopted by the community and by the companies, uh, maybe in the end we will remember it only as a, as a research topic and as, a, as an idea that came and passed. So I think this is a critical period, uh, the next two, three, five, four years, it's a critical period for, for SDN to be adopted and implemented in, the, in real world networks uh, so that it gains you know, significant traction. Thank you. Do you have more to add, or should we move on to another topic? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I agree with James. Education is the most important in academic. To me, we have two aspects. One for industry and one for academic. And uh, actually, we, we had done this in, I did this in last summer. Uh, Jim Min and uh, some owners and ambassador had held an event. We invite industry engineer and uh, also because Taiwan is a major hardware provider, most of them know the physical layer make them for upper layer software stack and uh, system or solution. They, they probably don't know how to do that. So we have an event to, to train them, them how to build a core in a box. And then the server was from local industry, like WNC, QDC, uh, QCD, Quanta, and uh, HCOR. And after the training, it seems we had two day, two day training. It seems very good. 
most of them can successfully install coin in the box. But we are very frustrated because code in the box keep changing. Uh, the training was on code in the box 2.0. Data point a three point zero release. And after a couple of months, four point zero release. So the the training is not going it is not working anymore because they try to install coin box 2.0 but the encounter must failure. Metal as a service because it changed. So if if the ONF or ONF keep keep changing this uh, open source and uh, do not have a stable version ready there, it's very difficult for academic to jump in and uh, to do some kind of training. We are very lucky. We we have many student resources in our school, so we. We have strong connection with our name, so we, we can keep moving. But if we want to train more people, we need a stable environment for us to, to teach. Yeah, that's a tr tricky problem, isn't it? Because by its very nature, we're trying to, to move fast and um, do you know, quarterly releases, releases or every four month releases with court. And uh, you know, and now we're uh, you know up to four dot zero, four dot one, coming shortly. Um, these newer releases are intended to make many of the problems you're having uh, go away and make it easier to do the installations and whatnot. You know, so but I think you know for all of the, um, the you know the educational um, line of thinking uh, and grappling with open source, the, the speed with which open source moves. You know, I think they're. There is an inherent, uh, you know, perhaps an inherent conflict, or you know, something we're going to have to grapple with. We we don't want to slow down open source. You know, it's, it's one of its greatest uh, advantages is is the speed with which it innovates and moves. So maybe Thomas, you have some thoughts about that. Well, I mean, definitely, I can see how um, some balance needs to be provided between stability in which you can build the training materials, right? Because you certainly don't want to invest in developing training materials uh, just for the thing you change. But also, on the other hand, the other side of the balance needs to be the freedom to move forward without being terribly encumbered by previously potentially low constant APIs or low constant design, right? Because you're moving fast. So there needs to be some balance. I mean, I know with Onos, for example, we try to handle that with our sort of beta annotations and our sort of incubation area, which is implicitly all beta, uh, which co located there or any APIs and services located there. So serve that purpose. This is a playground and, um, and it's, it's used at your own risk. And, uh, the code generally moves from there um, after it matures into the regular code area or into other applications. And that, that has a matter of fact with the latest release that has happened where we moved some applications which were previously in incubator into the apps. But uh, let me ask you a question here. You guys are not here to, to hear me talk. Um, so, I mean, I definitely see uh, the, the role of stability and the role of doc better documentation, but besides, besides that, uh, what other areas of uh, either functional areas um, or potentially even non-functional areas of ONOS uh, specifically you, would you like to see improved uh, to better support the needs of both uh, the, the educational aspects as well as potentially to feed research <coughs> So from my perspective, um, uh, so I also to link uh, my presentation to your question, it would be uh, nice to, to have a, a more clear uh, way, very well documented, of integrating uh, uh, orchestration algorithms. This is what our students, research students are doing. Mostly they are thinking about uh, 
new algorithm and protocols, but especially in, in the SDN environment, new algorithm to orchestrate the network in a better way. So uh, I've seen this happening in OpenStack, the, uh, at least the three attempts to uh, define frameworks to um, feed the orchestrator uh, with the result of algorithms that are run in a dedicated environment, so the result of these algorithms are then given to the uh, to the VM, and it will be nice to have a similar framework in, in the SDN environment. We have the intent framework, a good uh, a good start, but I feel that it is still too abstract. At least when we we try to explain it for the first time, um, uh, we see that people that are listening. The first time, maybe not even in the second time, I'll try to explain. So uh, there is a lot of abstraction. People are not uh, quite familiar with abstraction in, uh, in this field, so it would be maybe, uh, I think there is space for um, uh, some improvement in that perspective. Uh, when it comes to documentation that you mentioned, Thomas, uh, uh, effort that we started with Abdul Halim and Andrea Cabanella, the teaching brigade, is uh, a step towards the right direction because we're trying to create materials that will be used by students or by anyone actually, uh, in order to learn and uh, uh, try to use almost. Uh, this is one thing, so documentation should be it's very important. Uh, I think one aspect of honors that would help uh, students is the metrics. Uh, part where you want to measure uh, stuff because, uh, for example, you create an application and you're a master student like Demetrius is doing now um, in ONF, and uh, you want to uh, make a thesis out of it. So you have to write the thesis, the typical stuff. And one thing you should do though is uh, evaluate your system and uh, give numbers, give concrete. Uh, data of what, how the system works and uh, how it operates in harsh conditions and uh, what's the benefit of your application compared to the previous uh, uh, situation. So in order to do that, you need to provide data, as I said, concrete data, uh, that show that your solution is better than the previous uh, solutions. And the, the metrics part, the, how you uh, give and receive data to the system and uh, measure <coughs> what's going on before and after is a very important aspect too and it's usually neglected most of the times. That's good information, thanks. That's good, I, I see a metrics brigade uh, in the making. That's good. So, you know, Brian, you had a question? Yeah, thanks Thomas for, uh, for more or less uh, taking um, thanks, thanks for the panelists. Um, I think there has been an interesting and uh, very symbiotic relationship that you formed with both the ONF and with, with these communities, uh, or the ONOS community specifically. Um, the PhD students uh, are able to produce theses, we're able to get their great work, um, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, so, uh, really, I guess the, the question to kind of take Thomas's question in a slightly different direction is around uh, what are the challenges that you've experienced um, like actually seeing your your work go into production is it is it access to hardware is it access to test labs do you feel like you have the use cases in sufficient context to move forward um, like is there something the community could provide uh, from a from a tangible perspective um, outside of the platform that would, would help help with your work teaching IoT course and the little devices that I provide or ask students outside to buy the you know, Arduino and Raspberry Pi, which are $30, $40. Now, it's at the EdgeCore booth, uh, they is uh, you know, demonstrating, and then the P4 enabled, the Barefoot Networks device, cost $20,000, $30,000. So BMB2 is great for simulating the P4 Thing, um, but 
wondering if you can uh, make those devices much cheaper for graduate students or students to play around. Yeah. Or make them available virtually, yeah. you know, or get virtual translate. Yeah. Yeah, I can add <laughs> some more. Uh, uh, we need two, two things. The equivalent is one, and another one is the data, collection data. Because uh, we don't have real traffic in SDN domain, in, even in our campus, we cannot have. So all the experiment we do is artificial. It's not, not real. So maybe community can collect some real SDN and free data. It is a profile for academic to, to use. Another thing is, uh, I don't know why, it is supposed that education price for the manufacturer equipment should be cheaper than industry. But why we bought equipment in Taiwan is much expensive than Angleb. I think Angleb has a global image, so every Every manufacturer want to send in their, their, their device. But in academic, we, we don't have such uh, a, a, a attraction to attract the manufacturer to put their device to give to us. But fortunately, we, we, we NCTU is very lucky. We, we have some of the edge core WNG. And you asked how the community can help uh, the academia so that uh, our ideas become uh, uh, part of the industry. This is, this, is, this is the question, right? So we did uh, sort of an exercise uh, this summer with our team uh, because we uh, wrote a project proposal for the European Research Council again um, in asking for funding for a proof of concept for Artemis, the application that Dimitris Mavromatis is uh, uh, developing in the ONF. Uh, and the, the, this, the structure of the proposal of the European Research Council proposal is specific, like it has different chapters and you have to tackle different specific uh, uh, challenges. One of the biggest challenges when it comes to academia and the ideas that we have is actually disseminating them, making them known. Uh, people uh, uh, not knowing them, understanding them to, to, the, to its fullest depth, let's say, and uh, making them, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that is part of a discussion, of a, of a company, a corporate discussion. So I think what ONF is doing uh, with uh, Honors Build and with other events, uh, letting, uh, having uh, academic, academic people like us uh, having a stand to talk is, uh, is very helpful and uh, most, many things can also uh, be done towards this direction. So our work is uh, disseminated, as I said, uh, to the rest of the world and uh, through the collaborations that we have, uh, the partnerships that we have and all that. Uh, because, you know, having an idea is one thing, but from the idea to the proof of concept and then to the actual product, there is a long road. And there are many, many things that need to be done. But in my opinion, uh, marketing in general and also funding are the two main uh, things that uh, we need in order to make our uh, ideas a reality. Good, thank you very much. Marketing and funding, you know, the, the funding can be harder. The marketing we can help with more easily sometimes. And we do have a platform. And so I would offer that, um, you know, we're, I mean, for everybody really, you know, a vehicle for uh, blog posts and, and getting ideas out there is something that we'd be happy to work with all of you with and on. So that uh, wraps up our time. We've run just a touch over, you know, pulling the rug out. Uh, but I want to thank everybody very much. I'm sorry we didn't get to uh, your question. And, uh, <coughs> but thank you. Thank you to our panelists.